and we ask you to stay on mute and keep your cameras off just so there are no distractions while the presenter is speaking. If you have any questions during the webinar, please write them down in the chat box and you can see it circled there on, the, on your screen. Um, next slide, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> Okay, changing to speaker view. If you haven't already done so, we recommend changing your view to speaker view so you can see who is talking on the full screen. If you're joining from a computer, you need to click the button that says speaker view on the top right hand corner. If you're joining from an iPad, you'll need to select the switch to active button on the top left, left hand of the screen. If you only see the presenter and not the shared screen, you'll need to select the presenter screen that is shown at the bottom right hand corner. Um, can you go to the next screen there? I think sure we're, can. yeah, that one, that's the one we need, yeah. Okay, so there's the um, presenter screen which is shown in the bottom right hand corner down there. Okay, my name is Noella and I am an ambassador at the Kuchitin Conservancy. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, Wendat, and Medis peoples. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, and we are all treaty people. This webinar is part of our 2020 Adapted Passport to Nature program. Each month, we are offering free webinars that allow you and your families to learn about nature in the region. All of the webinars are made possible by our wonderful sponsors. Please consider supporting these businesses. All of them are local and um, are doing great work to help protect nature. Now the Conservancy is a nonprofit, non-governmental land trust. With the help of thousands of supporters like you, we've been able to protect over 13,000 acres of natural area in the Kuchiching Severn region. Hundreds of volunteers help us care for nature reserves through citizen science programs, monitoring, trail maintenance, and more. This Here's the map showing all of the nature reserves that our community of supporters help to protect in the region. Many conservancy owned nature reserves are open to the public with a total of 13 kilometers of hiking trails. We have just acquired two new nature reserves, the Taylor property and the Whitney property, thanks to our supporters. Now tonight, we, our presenter for this evening is Cameron Curran. Cameron's deep passion of nature and photography began at Lake Dalrymple in Carden, east of Aurelia. Through his involvement with the Kuchting Conservancy, Nature Conservancy of Canada, and other environmental organizations, he has spent countless hours on and photographing the diverse landscapes within our province. He holds a Master of Science degree in Rural Planning uh, from the University of Guelph. This evening, Cameron will share a selection of tips and tricks that he has learned throughout his career. Cameron is a firm believer in sharing his photography, knowledge for the betterment of nature and the community. So welcome, Cameron. Thank you very much, Noella, for having me. And good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending the Kuchitin Conservancy's virtual Passport to Nature program. My name is Cameron Curran, and I'm a member and volunteer with the Kuchitin Conservancy. Tonight, I will be presenting tips and tricks for your camera. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, we have overcome many hurdles by adapting to physical distancing requirements. And I really do commend the Kuchitin Conservancy on a job well done so far. I'll take a minute to introduce myself since we aren't able to meet in person and I do truly appreciate uh, you coming here today to Zoom. Using my camera to capture and share landscapes as well as the wildlife that call them home truly exhilarates me. You can ask any one of my family members if they've ever watched me stare at one single rock with a snake on it for two hours. They think it's absolutely bizarre, but I just can't get enough out of it and I love it very much. It has been that way since I purchased my first camera as a youngster and continues today with my business, Cameron Curran Photography. I have been learning the ins and outs of photography from the start and it has truly never stopped. It's a lifelong learning experience. What keeps me doing what I do is my emotional connection with nature. 
Since childhood, I have spent my summers, as Noella mentioned, in Cardin, Ontario, which is home of Lake Dalrymple and the globally rare wildlife habitat called the Cardin Limestone Plain, Alvar. I'm a naturalist first and a photographer second, which means that I prioritize the health of nature over disturbing it to get the perfect shot. My professional background is rooted in geography, earth system science, and the study of living and non-living things interacting in their natural environment. That's otherwise known as ecology. Currently, I'm studying and practicing land use planning for the Ontario Public Service. So photography allows me to capture the natural world and share its importance with others. Tonight's presentation will introduce you to the basics of nature photography. I will associate, uh, review the associated do's and don'ts or ethics of nature photography. I'll review camera terminology and functions, what makes a nature photograph, general tips and tricks for nature photography, and finally, I will conclude by reviewing the main takeaways that you can bring along with you as you practice nature photography. Feel free to have your camera in front of you tonight so that you can identify buttons and unique features as we move throughout tonight's presentation. I often hear people saying, I don't have an eye for photography, I don't know how to use my camera, and many other similar remarks. There is no denying that getting to know your camera can be a daunting task, leaving you feeling overwhelmed. But despite nature photography being a challenge, it is also a chance to courageously stretch your creativity, have fun, and share images of the natural environment with those around you. The reality is that there are hundreds of facts associated with photography that you will retain over the course of time. So why rush at learning them all at once? It's important to accept this and look forward to the countless images that lie ahead of you, whether they be good or bad, because they all are part of your learning experience. Set realistic goals and challenges for yourself. Every year, for example, I plan to photograph one species of wildlife that I have never captured before, and it truly fuels ambition. Tonight's presentation will provide you with the ingredients to start experimenting photog with photography on your own in order to gain more confidence. My goal is better to better to better acquaint you with your camera so that you can engage in successful and fun nature photography. You may never have used a camera or only used the automatic settings. Whatever the case, it's not a problem. Throughout the webinar, I will break down barriers that prevent beginners from grasping these concepts and encourage that learning to understand these factors will make your photo, uh, photography experience more worthwhile. But first I wanna talk about uh, the importance of respecting the natural environment while practicing nature photography. Because I, meant, I mentioned in the past, um, I'm a naturalist first or someone who studies the natural environment and a photographer second. It's important to not disturb wildlife habitat and be mindful of the plant and animal species that um, inhabit the surrounding environment. Always communicate your travel plan with family or friends when you're heading out on an adventure and stay on designated trails while in parks and other conservation properties. Sharing your photos on social media uh, platforms can also be sensitive um, in terms of exposing the uh, wildlife that live there to other people who may not have that same ethic or respect level. Um, so using features like camera zoom uh, can actually minimize disturbance to the natural environment because you don't actually have to walk into an area to take a picture of something. So really being mindful of the technology available uh, at your fingertips can help uh, with uh, practicing ethical nature photography. So as many of you may know, uh, especially if you have a camera, there are so many features, buttons, and, and many uh, terms that are associated with cameras. So um, I will provide a brief high level overview of some of those terms that I feel are some of the most important. So the first what I'm going to review is what's called the camera body, uh, which may seem obvious, but every single camera, does, um, no matter what kind it is, whether it's a cell phone, digital point and shoot, or like on the screen here, a professional digital single lens reflex camera, SLR, um, they are all the same in that they have a body and that they have also a lens. 
The camera body may seem obvious, but it is everything on the camera except for the lens as indicated by the hatched red box here. The camera lens also, it might seem obvious as well, um, may or may not be attached to the camera at all times. On professional cameras, such as the SLR camera on the screen, the lens can detach to allow the use of multiple lenses. Just because your lens is not removable does not mean your camera is not professional. The next feature that I'm going to speak about is the shutter. So the shutter is a feature that lets less or more light into the camera body by way of opening and shutting at a user set speed. So you can actually control how fast your shutter moves. Um, so following the shutter uh, is the next feature, which is called the viewfinder, which is indicated by the red hatched box on the screen. The viewfinder is a eyepiece that is located at the top of the back of the camera. You look through this eyepiece to line up what you're uh, basically taking a picture of. Um, so for cell phones and digital cameras, you may be thinking, I don't have one of these. And so what are you talking about? Well, you may know also that um, the back screen that is the LCD screen on the camera can also act as a viewfinder in the event you do not have one. So the back screen is a digital display that contains settings and where you can view photos after taking them. So it's really a multi-purpose um, feature on the camera that allows you to use your camera to its fullest extent. Right beside the back screen, typically uh, in that vicinity, you'll find the playback button. And pressing this will allow you to view previously taken photographs so that you can uh, tweak your settings as you go. The next feature that uh, I'll speak about briefly is the auto slash manual focus switch, which is often located on the actual lens itself. But for cameras that do not have switches on the lens, it may be located somewhere within the camera body. It really depends on the type of camera. It's a small switch on the side, as I mentioned, that which is used to control um, whether or not you're taking a photo um, in automatic focus or manual focus. Manual focus can be useful when you are um, photographing a subject that is not moving while your camera uh, has difficulty focusing automatically. So for example, if you were taking a picture of a bird that was sitting in a tree branch and there were moving leaves in front of the, the glass of your camera lens, you could uh, change your camera to manual focus to dial in that setting to be perfectly focused on the bird and it wouldn't uh, make any changes. All right, so the next feature that I'll talk about are within the camera body and it's a digital setting called the focus points. The focus points are the pinpoint locations in which your camera focuses on. They are displayed in the viewfinder or on the back of the screen uh, if your camera doesn't have a viewfinder. Your camera will allow you to use one or all of the focus points depending on your preference. So as you're taking a picture, these focus points will activate and basically lock to the subject that you're uh, taking a picture of. If you'd like to be more specific, you can actually change your settings to allow you to focus on any individual point that you would like. This can be useful in many different purposes, which I'll speak about later on. The next uh, feature on the camera that I'll speak about is one that many people hesitate to uh, sort of touch or uh, get into, and that would be the mode wheel or the modes dial. The mode dial is a feature used to switch from automatic uh, to special and or manual modes. So you can switch from automatic, which is typically um, shown as a green symbol. And you can also switch into a feature called M, which is manual. You'll note that there's probably five to six others on that wheel as well, but those are just sort of shortcuts to um, using manual features individually. I know that seems kind of vague, but we're going to focus on the fact that you can switch from automatic to manual. So within the manual mode of your camera, you can adjust the following three features. ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. 
These three features can be adjusted and the, and the adjustments can be seen on the back of your screen of your camera. These features are known as the big three and they are the main ingredients that make or compose a photograph. If you feel like adventuring away from the automatic features of your camera, the big three will definitely teach you a lot about photography. You might be wondering why there is a traffic light on the screen. Well, on a road trip, red, yellow, and green traffic lights enable you to successfully arrive at your destination. Although they're helpful, the lights can also sometimes be intimidating. Similarly, similarly intimidating, the big three settings of nature photography can enable you to successfully capture a well-composed photograph. Once better understood, ISO, aperture, and shutter speed will become less intimidating and your go-to tools for everyday photography. ISO, aperture, and shutter speed are the three fundamental settings that influence the outcome of a photograph. The values in which they are set to are dictated by your surrounding lighting conditions and also the distance to your photographic subject. Your goal as a photographer is to practice adjusting these settings until you find a balance between the three that generates a clear, well-lit, and in-focus photograph. Let's review how the big three contribute to your final photograph. So ISO is a setting. An ISO is a basically a number system that is a standardized uh, system from zero to 100,000. And it controls the light sensitivity that is received by the camera body. Lots of available light so for example, sunlight out in nature means that um, you will need to use a smaller ISO value because um, there is uh, already a great sensitivity of light being received by the camera body. ISO ranges, as I mentioned, from zero values from zero all the way to 100,000. And it's just an incremental, uh, um, basically number system that represents the level of light sensitivity your camera body receives and it is a great contributor uh, to the big three and ultimately your final photograph. Aperture allows less or more light into the camera, um, basically via the lens, so that's attached to the camera body. For example, aperture, which is also known as f-stop and can range from numbers from anywhere, for example, from 1.4 to f22, which is also just a number system representing the level to which the um, camera is able to receive light. So the smaller the number, the more light that is allowed into the camera and vice versa. The higher the number, the, the uh, less light that is allowed into the camera. And I'm just gonna repeat that just in case because A, I may have uh, mis, uh, uh, miscommunicated that, but the smaller the, ia, the smaller the aperture value, the more light that is allowed into the camera. And in contrast, the higher the f-stop or the aperture, the less light that is allowed into the camera. The following um, last member of the big three is shutter speed. And I alluded to that previously briefly. Uh, and it's the rate of speed at which the shutter on the camera body opens and closes, if you will. So when you have a fast moving subject, you're going to want a fast shutter speed. So in contrast, if you have a slow moving subject, you're going to want a slow shutter speed. The relationship and balance between the three makes a well-composed photograph. And all together, as you can see, they all come together to make that final picture. In reality, we can use a couple examples to show how this works exactly. So here on the screen, we have a picture of a black capped chickadee in flight and you can also notice that it's carrying a sunflower seed in its mouth and each individual feather on the bird is able to be distinguished um, basically from bottom to top there but you might notice if you look really closely there's a little bit of grain or a little bit of um, lack of clarity to the picture and that's because this photograph was taken under poor lighting conditions it was very cloudy the sun wasn't able to shine through as bright as possible, resulting in a low lighting environment. 
I happen to be far away from the subject when I took this picture, probably about 80 feet. And the, the subject, which is the black cat chickadee, was moving incredibly fast. So therefore, I took uh, that sort of problem scenario of all these conditions. And I set my camera's manual settings to the following um, three settings. So the red, the ISO was set to 8,000, which typically uh, you would, it wouldn't be that high, but given it was a poor lighting situation, we wanted to, to crank that up and very much raise it. The aperture was set to 6.3. In an ideal world, um, I would have set that lower, but the aperture is restricted to the capability of the lens. So the lowest that my camera was able to go was uh, 6.3, and rather my lens was able to go. The shutter speed that was used to capture this chickadee in flight was 1 25 hundredths of a second. So incredibly fast. So that um, in contrast, if I was using a slower shutter speed, I would have seen a blurred motion in the movement of the wing. But since I was using a high shutter speed, I could capture that brief moment in time where the, the bird had its wing extended open. In contrast, when I was uh, taking a picture of this uh, small Blanding's turtle on the side of the road, which was recently hatched, um, there were excellent lighting conditions because there was bright sunlight coming through the tree canopy or the forest canopy and evenly distributing a very nice light source. The subject that I was taking a picture of was very small and it was very slow moving. So um, it, was, it was stopped, it was kind of, it didn't know where it was going per se um, and it was taking its sweet time. So um, I then used my manual settings to basically ref, uh, tune them in to reflect the situation out in nature. And I used an ISO of 100. So as you can see, that is considerably less than the picture uh, previous where I used 8,000. So the light was very, very strong already. So I didn't need to crank that ISO. The aperture value was set to 2.8, which uh, in contrast to the previous picture, I used an aperture of six. So um, as you can see, it's lower, but the lens I was using was very, um, very much different in that it's, it's, max, it's minimum ISO is able to get set to a lower value. And the shutter speed, again, slow moving subject, slow shutter speed in this particular case. So photography is a science and there is uh, also so much more to it because it also is an art form as well. So the science of the big three settings will have you experimenting to capture clean images, but it's important to also consider that other side of, this, of, the, of the situation, which is that art, art side. A photograph comes together when you are prepared, ready to anticipate, and are in the right place at the right time. Once you are ready to capture a photo, be sure to consider design elements, which I'll go into in a moment when looking through your viewfinder. So what people don't realize is that most professional nature photography images that you see in magazines on Facebook or any other social media platform like Instagram are a result of going through what's called post processing, which is basically using your computer to optimize the visual output of your photograph. A lot of people call this photoshopped or edited, but there is a distinct difference between photoshopping an image and digitally optimizing it using a computer program. So the first um, element of design that I'm going to talk about is called balance in a photograph. So it's something that photographers pay attention to when looking at a photograph to ensure that the thing that they are taking a picture of, which is known as the subject, is adequately displayed and not uh, visually taken away from. So, um, for example, um, so for example, the painted turtle in the bottom corner here is located in the top half section of this picture. But you'll note that there is a uh, sort of an axis of symmetry here where there is a reflection of the turtle on the other half of the picture. If you were taking a picture of a turtle 
and there was no reflection in the water, you might consider putting the turtle in the center of the pic the image or looking through your viewfinder to line it up to find balance with other features in the photograph, such as the top right picture does, which is the black capped chickadee in the tree. You'll notice that the black capped chickadee is not in the complete center of the photograph and rather it's just off to almost the first third on the right hand side. Uh, that's because there are other features in the photograph such as tree branches and we like to make sure that everything in the photograph is well balanced. So same with the loon in the bottom here. Uh, the common loon is located on the right hand side of the picture, but I really wanted to emphasize the fact that this, this common loon surfaced to the water and generated quite um, an amount of activity in terms of um, ripples and that sort of thing. So um, there is balance to the photograph and it does help tell the story of the photograph a little bit better. So the second design element that I'll talk about is actually shapes. So looking for different patterns and shapes in your, in your photograph is another thing that enhances the ultimate um, end product that you're generating. So there's dimensions that you can see that um, are basically turning their attention away from the main subject. So for example, I'll talk about um, this Northern Cardinal over here. Um, the Northern Cardinal is sitting on a tree branch, but you can see there's a general pattern of lines in the picture that are typically ver vertical. So there's a trend of vertical lines that go across the whole entire picture. You'll notice as well that there are small little circular red dots everywhere, which really helps tie into the Northern Cardinal. And those little red dots, of course, are tree buds on a a maple tree that is about to um, come into bloom in the springtime. So just extra little details to con uh, consider like that. And then of course this ring necked snake over here that was uh, found on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula um, up near Tobermory is situated on a piece of basically limestone rock that had been um, basically crashed against shore so much that it had rounded. And so not only is the, sh uh, the shape of the snake um, going like a, a twisty, turny sort of pattern or design, um, but the actual curvature of the rocks can be considered and included in this photograph as well. So I made sure to include the top line of this rock, top line of this one, and top of this one. So it really ties the final image together. And so um, you can pick out shapes in your own photographs and you may have seen some some shapes and patterns in these examples as well so i'd consider you uh bit, sorry um urge you to to consider these things um, in your own photography so so the difference of light tones in a photograph and dark tones is known as contrast and so we can use contrast to ultimately help tell a story um, within a photograph by using the tones to highlight certain features. So in this particular example, um, I'm looking at what's called an alvar, which is an, an area, an ecological area uh, found in Cardin, Ontario, which is uh, where I've spent most of my free time and I've done a couple, a few work contracts there. Um, so what there is, is there's shallow soil upon limestone or dolostone bedrock. The dolostone and limestone bedrock are the, the product of formation uh, from ancient seafloors turning into rock, essentially. So I wanted to use contrast here to darken some of the, the earthy tones in the front of the picture or the bottom of the picture. And I wanted to make that gray limestone dolostone bedrock uh, pop out very bright to, to tell people the story that they're walking upon um, fossilized seafloors. So, um, you know, using those sorts of differences to help tell a story within a photograph um, can definitely add value and um, as a design element. So, so there are different scenarios um, take photographs in and uh, nature photography doesn't really pinpoint one exact area. So it's more of an all-encompassing term to talk about all of the neat natural things that you can take pictures of. The first one that I'm going to talk about uh, tonight is landscape photography tips. 
So within the um, sort of area of landscape photography, um, it's important to consider the, um, all, the frame of your photo by looking through your viewfinder um, and basically to find a good vantage point in which to take the photograph from. Finding that spot or vantage point can be dictated by other things like what time of day you are doing it at. So for example, sunrise and sunset. Um, these are times where the light that is reflected off different objects um, can ultimately influence the outcome of your photograph. So looking at the, the on the screen here, you can see, probably tell that um, I might be facing either east or west, which in this particular case, I'm facing west. And the sunlight is hitting the right-hand side edge of the tree here. Um, so I'm taking a picture at sunset directly into the sun. Um, so basically you can control what the photograph looks like based on what direction the light is coming from. And I think in landscape photography, that's one of the most important tips that I can share um, is paying attention to what direction the largest light source that you have is coming from. On a day where it's cloudy and the, the clouds act as a filter of that very bright sunlight, it's a little less important, but it's still noteworthy to pay attention to. Um, the use of a tripod is highly recommended when you're um, taking pictures of the landscape, because if you are using a tripod, you're adding an extra element of stability to your, your camera and thus your photograph. So the camera, when it's not on a tripod, has the capability of moving up, down, left, right, side, side, and in multiple direct and dimensions. So um, using a tripod to um, keep the camera stable for when you're using slower shutter speeds, for example, can really help to influence, positively influence the outcome of your photograph. Um, so another thing in landscape photography is to use a wide angle lens. Now you might be thinking, I only have one camera. I have an iPhone. I have a, um, a Canon power shot or whatever you have um, that only has one lens. So do I have a wide angle lens? Well, one key indicator of if your camera has a wide angle lens capability is usually around the perimeter of the lens itself, you'll be able to see values that are in the form of millimeters. And a wide angle lens is typically constituted of between 10 and 40 millimeters. Um, so um, a basic introductory SLR camera, um, definitely iPhones and Canon power shots and whatever other brand of camera you have generally has that wide angle feature. When you get into those professional grade cameras, different lenses will dictate whether or not you have the potential for using a wide angle lens. What a wide angle lens does, I'll get to the point now, is that it allows you to view more of the landscape because there is a sort of a larger area of influence that the camera is able to see. So definitely a big consideration is to use those wide angle capabilities. Um, as you can see in the example here, um, this is uh, at Chutes Provincial Park, which is uh, on, along Highway 17 there, um, heading towards uh, Sault Ste. Marie. And the picture is very wide in nature. Um, this picture is actually the result of a post-processing exercise that I did. Um, and so it kind of ties together that I'm using a wide angle lens, but I didn't hesitate to use my computer to make sure that the picture was perfectly framed and was exhibiting the same qualities or similar qualities as I was seeing in person. So don't be afraid to put your images on your computer and experiment with post-processing. You can um, look up several different programs. Um, I particularly use Adobe uh, Photoshop Lightroom, but uh, there are other options as well that um, are less cost costly and um, can provide you with similar results. So. The next area of nature photography that I'll talk about is wildlife photography. And it is my favorite type of photography because you just don't know what lies ahead or around the corner. You could have an animal run out in front of you with no notice, or you could spend hours with absolutely no movement in anywhere around you. But 
just it just could come right around the corner and surprise you. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. So one, oh, my computer's going by itself there. Um, so one main point of emphasis that I'd really like to get across is when you're taking picture a picture of any type of wildlife, um, I like to emphasize to get on the same horizontal plane or same um, level of view as the as the species of wildlife. But you may be thinking, oh, I wish I could get on the ground and I wish I could lay on my stomach in a muddy environment. Well, I, I do believe that there are creative ways to come, uh, basically work around these challenges. And it could be anything from setting your camera up on a self timer, placing it on the ground directly pointed at the, the subject of the uh, photograph and letting that camera take the picture by itself. So there are ways to work around it, but ultimately what it does as represented by the red arrow on the screen here is it allows you to take a picture of that uh, species of wildlife. For example, this green frog here, uh, right on the angle that you are seeing it. So what you can actually see is the, the frog here um, in high detail. Um, and you can actually see the water coming up to the, the frog's sort of chin, just under the chin area, in that it's um, statically, it's, the water statically attaching to the frog. So these are things that if you were to take a picture of the frog from above, you may not notice. And also it provides an excellent axis of symmetry or line of mirroring for the photographic subject. Um, the next example I'll talk about is the fact that when we're switching between landscape and wildlife uh, photography tips, some of them are interchangeable. And in fact, I would argue that mostly all of them are. So in this particular example, I'm taking a picture of a male mallard duck, and it's in a relatively calm um, maple swamp here. Um, and I'm uh, kind of laying down on the ground there on the University of Guelph Ar Arboretum's brand new boardwalk, which happened to also make for an excellent little tripod stabilizer for my lens. So what I was able to do here was utilize the sunlight that was coming from behind me that was shining directly on the duck to create for a very well lit environment. And I was able to use my um, use the boardwalk to stabilize my lens and optimize my big three settings to be able to capture this duck in crisp clarity, um, also providing a nice axis of symmetry or line of mirroring in the water because of the angle that I was uh, taking a picture of the uh, duck on. And I was just about to say on the angle I was shooting the duck on, and that would uh, be no pun intended, but uh, it's uh, an interchangeable term, of course, uh, that's used with taking a picture is uh, shooting or capturing uh, um, wildlife, which is a bit ironic. So in terms of long distance photography, I'd like to uh, sort of stress that the same thing applies in terms of lens or camera stability. So as you can see here, I'm actually holding what's called a monopod, which is like a single leg tripod which enables me to ensure that my camera is not moving up and down. There's a little bit of side to side motion, but that's not too much of an issue when I'm dealing with a vertical subject, such as this beautiful bald eagle here that's flying in the sky. Um, so I can engage in some discussion later, but as you can see, once again, this bird has a wing on it that is very stable, crisp, clear, and well-defined. So, um, it's implied that you might be thinking that I used a fast shutter speed because I'm taking a picture of a fast flying bird. So you're probably correct on that if that's what your guess was. And if not, that's not a problem because this was a, these are concepts that have been developed over um, around a decade of time for myself at least. So um, with respect to a flying object, which in this case would be a bird, I'd like to emphasize the importance of how your camera focuses. I'd like you to think about that uh, one feature that I talked about at the beginning called the focus points. So when I'm taking a picture of a flying bird, I typically like to stick around this and can uh, have control over the center focus point only, which is displayed by the red circle um, in the middle of the diamond, um, for those who cannot see red. Um, 
right here. So um, what that enables you to, to, to do basically is um, lock yourself uh, on the bird as it moves. And what you can do is use YouTube and other um, online resources to, to find out the different focusing modes of your camera. Because what will actually be done is your camera can actually track the movement of the flying bird. And this um, can be done on, in camera, on cameras uh, that are as old as 10 plus years old. So the technology has been around for quite a while. And of course, lastly, be patient and use a long lens or a long focal length to make sure that you're staying adequately far away from the photographic subject. So basically, um, what, another thing that applies through all of the, the different areas of nature photography is the fact that nature photography is always conducted in different seasons as we move throughout the year. Seasons may be longer and shorter based on where you live. I know we have people attending today from all around. So it's uh, important to, to pay attention to those sort of regional seasonal trends that you have and make the most of them. I'll use the example. My partner and I went to Newfoundland last year and we went in late September. So the first thing people think of usually when they um, you know, go to Newfoundland is the puffins, which are these cute little birds. And as you can see, I'm leaning on a chair that kind of looks like a puffin. But really, um, fortunately, um, the other thing that people think of is basically the Grand Banks, Grand Banks of Newfoundland and the very um, sort of stunning geology or rock formations that are formed there. So uh, we showed up to Newfoundland late September. The puffins were not there. And that was perfectly fine because they had gone and, and basically flown away because the, the temperature and the environment of this place in Elliston, Newfoundland was no longer suitable for them and they went off to migrate basically. So I, we were left with um, taking pictures of many other beautiful things, but we came to this iconic puffin site and they're not there. So we wanted to make the best of it, have fun and ultimately be safe. So there's so much more to photography than those iconic species. And, and another one I'd like to point out, and it's not on the screen, but would be uh, moose in Algonquin Park. I definitely hear um, people saying all the time, oh, I got to get up to Algonquin Park just to go see a moose. And I thought, I think to myself, there's hundreds of natural phenomena to see in Algonquin and um, you may or may not see a moose. So it's important to open your mind and, and have fun, whatever the case may be. This is a photograph of what I'm talking about, and it's uh, the ge geolo geological foundation or the rock foundation ex uh, experienced in Newfoundland. So um, this photo is the result of post-processing, and I was able to crop it to be able to display basically the full um, setting in which I wanted to take a picture of. And it's well-defined, the colors, are popping out and you'll even be able to see different patterns and design elements in the photograph, whether they be lines, contrast, uh, different patterns and the way the photo is balanced. In this photo, you can uh, probably see the left side contains a lot of land and the kind of right half or two thirds contains a fair amount of water. So I did wanna ensure a little bit of balance. So, um, yeah, that's what we say about that. And uh, the next thing we go around the corner, we're in Newfoundland on the, basically the Grand Banks and we come around the corner and this thing runs across the field. Couldn't quite tell what it was. It stops for a second, but um, due to our elevation change between the fox, what it ended up being and me, the fox wasn't able to see me. So I was able to, um, due to the elevation difference basically. So the fox was down in a valley. I was up around a rock on the top there and um, the wind was going in the opposite direction. So the, the fox could not smell or hear me. Um, and I was able to get a picture from 150 feet away uh, without it noticing me. Um, so um, clearly the fox was definitely concerned by our presence there. Um, because it's basically going to, it's pouncing on the ground right now to basically um, dig out its prey, which ended up being a small mouse. So um, there are opportunities if you give wildlife space, you don't have to get right up close to them to experience them doing what they do in the natural environment. So um, it's moments like these that um, really make everything worth it. 
So nature photography is an ongoing experiment involving natural light, landscapes, and wildlife. Despite occasionally being a challenge, nature photography is an enjoyable pastime that can yield beautiful results. You just have to be patient. The big three settings, ISO, aperture, and shutter speed are the primary ingredients for a well-composed photograph. Creating compelling images involves design considerations and thinking creatively and outside of the box. Learning by doing is the best way to develop your skills and the camera is in your hands. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, I'll take uh, any questions that may have been in the chat box or once that's over, we can uh, do some audio questions as well. Um, and then just before that, I do produce every year a nature photography calendar in which a uh, small amount of proceeds go to the Kuchichin Conservancy who hosted this webinar tonight. So it's available for sale. So you can get in contact with the Kuchichin Conservancy or myself and we can make that happen for you. I'll turn it over to the Kuchin Conservancy. Thanks, Sam. Um, so people can uh, message me directly with questions or they can just put it into the chat box and it's automatically um, set to send to everyone. So either one is fine. Um, there's been a few questions that have come in and I have questions myself as well. So get ready, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question is, uh, how do I make the water of a stream or creek look silky? Yeah. That's a fantastic question. You may have been able to notice that um, one of my photographs was exhibiting the same characteristics. I'll go back to it there. If it lets me. Um, oh, it went way back. So to answer your question, the water that's moving in the stream or the river or whatever water feature that you have is typically moving at a fast rate or at, in, at an, in any case it's moving at a given rate over time so it's moving at a distance over time you want to be able to capture that movement over a given amount of time so what you do is you you for one you evaluate the lighting situation that you have so if you have a moderately well-lit environment, you can set your ISO to probably, um, you know, 200. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to control your shutter speed to be able to capture that water moving over a given amount of time. So you're going to want to set your shutter speed to actually um, the reverse of what you'd normally. So you'd normally set your shutter speed to a fraction of a second to to, to, capture a move, uh, to capture a stationary object, but you're actually gonna wanna move in the other direction and set the shutter speed to full seconds. So to set it to one, two, three, four seconds so that you're able to capture that moving water as the shutter opens and the shutter closes. And at the very end, your photograph will result in this silky appearance here that displays the water moving over a given amount of time. So that's the answer to that one. And are you using a, you're using a tripod, yeah. It is uh, pretty mandatory to use a tripod. Um, if you're stuck and you don't have a tripod, you are welcome to use the ground or any other thing that um, uh, you can balance the camera on. But it is um, in a pinch. Uh, you actually don't need a tripod. Um, so it's not um, sort of a life or death situation. You can actually um, rest the uh, camera on a ledge or whatever have you. Just make sure the camera doesn't move very much. So. Um, there's a question about, uh, based on a Nikon and MacBook, which uh, editing software do you recommend? Right. Um, so right off the bat, um, of course, I'm not endorsed by Adobe Photoshop Lightroom, but uh, I'm a firm uh, believer and confident user in that software. And so um, it is Mac and PC friendly and of course, um, interchangeable. So if you're using uh, Lightroom on a Mac, you can take the, the files that you have there and use it over on a, uh, a PC as well. There are ways to do that. So um, right off the bat, um, I would recommend Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. It's designed exactly for the purposes of data management and photo optimization. Yeah. 
There was a question actually about um, data management, sort of. Do you have any okay. strategies for organizing photos on your computer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure everyone can attest to um, file management uh, struggles and uh, for sure it's people say oh, what can I do to make my file management easier for the rest of my life and really in my opinion there's ways to stay organized but it's always going to be a continual challenge what I do is I actually organize my my original image files by date so um, I'll have a 2020 folder um, a calendar year uh, basically so January through December and then within there, um, I will have different um, either dates or main events. And so right in my Windows Explorer, or if you're in um, the Mac world, you can use your um, file management system to navigate based on time. And it's often handy to do that because there are platforms that you can use um, like Windows Photo Viewer or Mac Photos, uh, iPhoto, that will take those original files that you have and they'll display them in a sort of a chronological format based on your your own hierarchy so the short answer is is it's not easy with file management especially when you have hundreds of thousands of pictures on your hard drive and uh it's just you make the best of it yeah and i find sometimes i take multiple pictures because you know i take the first one and then i change the angle a bit so sometimes it's just process of going through and deleting the ones that are like not the best ones. Yeah. And just of note, when you're, there's different ways that your camera can take a photo in terms of the file that it's saved to. So your camera can either take what's called a JPEG, which is a relatively low file, a small file size, or it can take what's called a raw or CR2 file that is typically around 20 megabytes. So if you've got, um, you know, thousands of those, it adds up a lot of, to a lot of space. So it's important to consider. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, another question, or there's a few questions coming in. Um, what is your recommendation for focusing on high speed photography, such as birds in flight, hummingbirds, lighting, etc., in order to catch the fast moving object and have it in focus? Yeah, I have that question as well. I tried to get a photo of a a kinglet the other day and I could not keep it I just it was moving around so fast I don't know <laughs> how do you make birds stay in one spot <laughs> well there's two two ways to interpret that question how do you make birds stay in one spot mm, not too much of an option there other than there are people who feed birds and they they set up uh, in their backyard, they set up uh, basically little perches and they set up their feeders around trees in which the birds will land before they go to the feeder. Um, so you can actually do that. And um, people have different views about feeding birds and that's a whole other topic on its own. And there fortunately was a webinar by the Kuchishin Conservancy a few weeks ago that explained a little bit about that. But in terms of photographing a moving bird in the air, the one thing that I would really emphasize is for the person photographing the bird to stay in one spot, um, because that's gonna do a few things. That's going to um, keep you um, from disturbing the bird and it's gonna keep it like from not being startled by you. So that's one. But in terms of using your camera to take a picture of a moving bird, that's where I wanna emphasize the um, importance of investigating your camera's focus modes and their capabilities. And I could go into a whole two hour segment on that topic alone. And so um, what I would recommend is look up on YouTube, Google it, um, how to use my camera's focus modes to move, or sorry, to capture a moving subject in flight. And um, you're gonna wanna use a fast shutter speed you're going to want to use a sort of a moderate aperture, which could be maybe six to seven. And you're going to want to use a relatively, depending on the lighting conditions, you'll have to use a moderately high ISO. And the, it's really just a game of experimentation. So you gotta, typically, um, I took a picture here, um, I'll go back, of this bald eagle. Um, 
actually I've taken probably 2000 pictures of this bald eagle and um, because I'm aware of where it's nesting. And um, it wasn't until maybe the 10th time that I ever went out and tried to take a picture of this bird that I was able to capture the wings in crisp definition like this. And the sun was shining perfectly on the bird, illuminating every little feather. And so, um, you know, it's just a game of experimentation. I've got many photos of this exact bird that do not look anything like this. So uh, patience and experimentation. Good. Um, there's another question about um, maintenance uh, for your camera as far as cleaning, calibration, things like yeah. that. Right. All right, so um, in terms of a digital point and shoot camera um, or an iPhone, the importance applies to both. Um, and I use the word iPhone, but I also mean Android device. Um, you can use a microfiber cloth to clean your lens and smartphones are actually starting to generate messages for you now. Your lens is dirty, please clean it. Um, so cleaning your lens is so important because um, your camera will not be able to decide what to focus on with those that diamond shaped focus point unless the lens is clean. So um, when we use the example of a uh, professional level uh, SLR camera, what you can do is uh, similarly clean the actual lens glass, which is located there. You can't, there you go. And you can also take the lens off and I'll do this in midair like this. And in there, you can actually see this one here has actual mirrors inside. You can't really tell, but you can use tools from a cleaning set. So you can buy a cleaning set for basically a cleaning kit for $15 that has like a blower and you can blow the dust off of the mirror. Um, another thing that you want to do is you want to use that microfiber cloth to clean other areas of the camera as well. Um, if your camera happens to have a flash or an area called a hot shoe, which is, which is the area for the flash to attach, you want to make sure that those electronic uh, connections are very clean, free of dust, any sort of debris that could have caught on there. Um, so, you know, your camera's at high risk of being exposed and um, trampled on and <laughs> thrown off a, a rock or dropped into a dropped into a, a pile of sand, which is catastrophic. But um, being on top of the, the cleaning um, by doing those simple things makes a really big difference every time you use your camera. So yeah, those are some ideas. Yeah, thanks. That's uh, a lot of um, There's another question in the chat. Uh, should focus point be normally in the middle? Uh, also, you mentioned Adobe Lightroom. Could you please explain more uh, what you do using it? Yep. Um, so uh, I'll talk about the um, Adobe component. As I mentioned, the post-processing or um, altering of your picture after it's been taken um, does a few things. So um, depending on the file format that the picture is saved in. So um, you're able to do different things. So if you have Adobe uh, Photoshop Lightroom and you have an SLR camera, a professional camera or um, sort of equivalent, I would recommend taking your pictures in raw format or CR2 format. These, what happens here is the file size is a lot larger when you're taking pictures in this format but the reason that is, is because the data or information that is being saved to the photographic file contains information about the uh, characteristics of the photo. So the file for a CR2, uh, so the raw, the raw CR2 file contains data on the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, the amount of light that was um, captured in the photograph based on basically a graph. It can, it can plot how the, the light looks on what's called a histogram. And um, there's many benefits. So if you're using Photoshop Lightroom, definitely uh, use that raw 
feature. And to answer the question about how do you use Lightroom, once again, uh, that's probably about a, a five day explanation. Uh, but um, ultimately, you want to make sure that your camera is, or sorry, that your photograph is well lit by controlling the brightness or exposure. You want to ensure that um, the subject is in sharp focus, which you can also control. Um, you can remove noise in Lightroom. You can change different color levels. You can change a blue sky into a pink sky. Um, there's many different things that you can do. And once again, I would not hesitate to um, do some YouTubing and look it up. And uh, I'll be in the new year um, offering some quick uh, mini courses on these topics as well. So you can stay tuned to CameronKern.ca. So, and then there was a second part to that question, Tanya. Yeah, let me just, talk. I think part. it was just about um, if you should normally focus uh, in the middle. Could you set your focus point? Right. Um, it's always safest, in my opinion, but um, you can set your focus point to the middle or you can set the focus point um, to be automatic to pick up any of the focus points. Um, it's really up your preference and based on the um, scenario that you are in. So if you were taking a picture of a bird at a bird feeder and your camera was on a tripod pointing right at the bird feeder, you're going to want to have that center focus point active by itself to ensure that no other area in that viewfinder will be focused on except the middle. Great. Um, there were a few people that sent in questions when they registered. Um, one of them is, are there any tips to have moderately high shutter speed without raising the ISO too much? shutter speeds um yes so the one situation in which that would apply to as if the light in the environment was very bright um so basically um let's use an example of if you were uh, taking a picture of um a bird in flight and we're going to use that again but um and it was just the sunniest day you could imagine um and and you wanted to capture its moving wing. Um, you're gonna want to, in terms of uh, the photo clarity and stuff, um, you're gonna wanna lower the ISO um, and you're gonna want to turn up the shutter speed. But there's going to be a balance in which you will notice that you're gonna hit like a sweet spot of the picture's clear, the wing is in complete captured focus. And, um, and then, uh, so from that point, um, leading up to that point, you're doing a lot of experimenting of, oh, I'll, I'll raise the ISO by 300. Oh, I'll raise it another bit. Like, so you're going to take probably, you're going to take some diagnostic photographs to be able to gauge how low you can get that ISO without the picture not being bright. So, and as I've been told by many of my mentors throughout the years, using a high ISO is not always a bad thing because you can actually capture some phenomenal um, sort of things out in nature. So don't hesitate to, to use that high ISO like I did with that chickadee picture earlier in the presentation. It was kind of grainy, but it was neat to see that wing all in, in focus. So. Um, I just wanted to do a time check. We're five minutes after eight o'clock. There's yeah. quite a few questions. Okay. <laughs> There's probably six questions, but I'm wondering if um, maybe we can put the questions, um, I can send them to you and that can be like an email that goes out to all the participants answering some of those questions. Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're not going like, like, we could probably talk about photography and cameras, as you said, like for another two hours. <laughs> A couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think that um, Noella has some info to um, end off the session. Uh, that was really interesting. I mean, I had um, I had my camera out the whole presentation and was like playing and trying to figure out how to change my settings. So yeah, that was really interesting. Thanks so much, Cam. My pleasure. Anytime. Thank you, Cameron. 
So before everyone leaves tonight, we just want to remind you to keep an eye out on our website and social media for more webinars. There are a couple coming up next month, um, as you can see on the screen, Diverse Passion and Craig Craighurst. Um, and we want to thank everyone for attending and a special thank you, Cameron, for sharing your uh, photography knowledge with us. Have a You're good day. You're very night. welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay, we'll talk to you later. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks Cam. for having me again, guys. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks, Cam. You're welcome. Really well done, perfectly presented. Oh, thank you very much.